introducing our speaker. Um, so for the theme magic, um, we were thrilled again to, to be in a magical venue and exploring Josephine's background, it was just an absolute perfect fit for today. Um, so Josephine has been in Asia for 30 years, in Hong Kong for 30 years, uh, and has been a show producer for 20 plus years. Um, she has created Orient Unlimited, Orient Snow. They're the industry leaders in winter effects. Now when you come to Hong Kong, you don't think about snow. Um, we got pretty close with some icicles last, last January, February, which was insane. Um, but she's been producing, you know, she's built Orient Unlimited and Orient Snow on the foundations of cross-pollinization, hybridization of skills. So from anything from graphics, architecture, film, theater. Um, they're creating very unique, very special magical shows um, that are um, extremely special with um, live events, brand experiences, visual arts, performing arts, and, and you must hear a story from Josephine on magic. Please welcome her to the stage. extrapolated that across into lots of different work. So if you look at our body of work, we do do very, um, a very broad spectrum. And it will become apparent when I do my talk why that's possible. And it also relates actually to the presentation from SCAD and what I consider to be essential to the creative process. So, magic. <laughs> Let me work out how to use my little clicker. Okay, the subject of magic. Some of you will be expecting the next slide. Any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Now that doesn't really apply so much anymore in as much as we don't think about magic, we think about different, um, we're more advanced now. So my next slide describes what that is. A friend of mine used to live in a Pacific island and he told me the story of the very first building that installed a lift. And the islanders came and sat in the lobby and came to see the magic box where the lift doors open, people go in, the doors close, they open again, and the people have disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, those same Pacific Islanders are probably now watching this on podcast from their smartphones, so times have changed. But I still believe that magic exists. So I'd like to introduce you to my imaginary friend, Alonso. Alonso was taken to see a magic show by his family and he was so captivated that he begged to be given a magic kit and duly in time he got the magic kit. He opened it up and inside he found a set of instructions, the principles of doing the magic tricks and some little artifacts to do them with. A week later he's standing in front of his family in the living room on the sofa whipping plastic flowers out of his cuff and going, pick a card, any card. 30 years later, he's managing to make a Boeing 747 disappear on a tarmac broadcast live around the world. So there are two things that are important in that story. The first is, he believed in magic. As soon as he opened up that magic kit, he knew it didn't exist anymore. But when he presented it to his family, it became magic again. So the partnership that we as creatives, and we as human beings, frankly, is that we always understand that what we create has an end purpose, and that we have to have an audience, and we have to understand that audience. How should you work the sponge in? Okay. <laughs> okay, so, four or five very different people from very different backgrounds, and how are they all connected? How do they relate to magic? How do they relate to the creative industries that we're all in? The thing is, it's not what they do, it's how they think that's important, it's the thing that connects them. So all of them have the ability to observe information around them. That's where the sponge comes in. 
And what they're able to do, like young Alonso, is understand the principles of what they're viewing, break it apart, and then reimagine it and fill in the gaps to create something new. So Peter Jackson, at the time that he went from being uh, an average filmmaker and signed a deal to make the biggest trilogy of films ever, didn't actually have all of the technology in place to create the vision of the Lord of the Rings. But he understood the principles of his craft, which was filmmaking and storytelling, well enough that he was confident that he could fill in the gaps as he went along. And he understood that his imagination, the imagination of the people that he knew in his sphere, who came from technology and software development, not necessarily his natural field, that they could also come along for the ride and fill in the gaps. Um, Jules Verne, Man on the Moon. Jules Verne wrote From the Earth to the Moon. He was a French fiction writer in the 1800s. But he was a curious man, and like all the rest of them, he has a sponge for a brain. So he absorbed information and inspiration from all around him, and he went to a science fair. From that science fair and a small piece of theoretical science that was coming up, he managed to create a whole story. And in this story, he sends men to the moon, three men to the moon. 104 years later, we actually went to the moon. What's interesting about this is that Jules Verne, a French science fiction writer in the 1800s, got so much of it right. And he was able to do that because he was able to take apart the science and go away and do his homework and fill in the parts. So he said that it would be the Americans that would go, and he was right. He did his homework and he worked out that they would launch from Florida. In fact, he was only 137 miles in his book from where they actually took off. He said it would take three days to do the journey. And his protagonist, when they came back, would land in a splash down in the Pacific Ocean, all of which was bang on. So that's the power of imagination, and that's what we do as creators. We absorb information, and then we're able to see between the gaps and fill it in, and come up with new inventions and new ways of creating. Sponge again. Apparently, I have it on good authority that children have sponges for brains. <laughs> so, here's the thing. As creators, I think it's important to keep as much of our sponge-like qualities as we can. The more porous our brains are and the more willing we are to absorb information, not just from our discipline, but from other disciplines, the more advances we make. As soon as we have context on a larger scale, we start to join the dots together a lot quicker. And from that, we come up with original, creative propositions, whether it's in science, physical theorists, theatre producers, film directors, we're able to do that because we absorb a lot of information and we're open to that process. One of my favourite things, I love zoetropes, I talk about them all the time in the office, my team is sick of them, but I think they're important. And the reason they're important is that there's a trick in there, going back to magic. You see on the left-hand side, there's the picture of the flip book. You'll all be familiar with this, and you'll be familiar with zoetropes. You draw a series of still pictures, and then you flip the book, or you spin the drum, and the faster you go, there you have the illusion. You have a prancing pony or a dancing person. Now, we as creative, and actually we as human beings, because this isn't limited to the creative industries, we are Schrodinger's cat. We are, at one and the same time, a creator and an audience member. And so we can see the film where it's moving fast and we've got the prancing pony, but we're also aware of the individual frames that went before it. So we understand the trick, but we allow ourselves to enjoy the magic of that moving film. And this is important because Peter Jackson, Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, they saw things in frames. They were able to look at anything within their sphere of interest, boil it down to the important parts, and still perceive the gaps in between. 
And that's where we as creators and creative thinkers and creative lively minds go. We find the cracks, we find the gap, we try and join the dots. And the quicker we join the dots, the better the illusion is, and the better we become at our craft. I've been a bit ambitious and I've done the history of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> All on one slide, yeah, I'm a bit fuzzy on the date. And I've got a very dry mouth because I'm quite nervous, I don't like talking in public. <laughs> what a show producer I am. <laughs> So, 200,000 BC, the first modern man appears. 34,400, I did Google that, first known cave painting. And then we have a big gap, and we have a big gap because although we had astronomers and scientists, we also had a society of fear and repression and dogma that held back discoveries. And we were also in the Dark Ages. We didn't have the access to information, and we didn't always have the access to our audience. But something really fun happened in the early 1800s. We had the first photograph in the 1820s. Then we had the zoetrope, my favorite. <laughs> then we had Jules Verne in 1865, writing from the Earth to the Moon. <laughs> 1904, we get the electric telegraph. Then we get the first talking film, Sputnik, the first satellite in space, Telstar, communication satellite, very important, and then we have the moon landing. I'm just going to start connecting the dots here. We have the World Wide Web launched, and then Google and the other search programs. So what's happening here? We've got an unprecedented access to real-time information from outside of our usual sphere of influence and knowledge. We're not bound by geography anymore. The first fiction writers gave us imagination, but now we had access to information from scientists, writers, film directors, photographers, artists, architects. I mean, every industry that you can think of in science or the arts, we now had access to them. And once we had access to them, we had more inspiration, and our sponges had more things to soak into it. Now, we don't always have an awareness of what we're absorbing. But when we have to create, which most of us do, things come to the surface and we start to join the dots, like that Zoe trope. Sputnik, first satellite, Telstar satellite, moon landing. In 1969, the whole world watched on while we landed on the moon. Fantastic adventures for man. For man. Big achievement, bit of a jolly wheeze. But most people were inspired, but didn't see the real world applications. After these moments, we have the World Wide Web and Google and all of the other platforms. And we're starting to see the real world applications of these formerly brilliant but woolly brained scientists halfway around the world and how it affects us. And how it's affecting us is it's making us better at what we do. So I'm going to skip from my history of humans into so i'm coming to what i do for a living now it's my grand finale um, i produce in theater originally most of my team come from theater and film industries but I've always had a policy of we'll play nice with anybody. So we have young artists, we have architects, we have photographers, we have interior designers, we have people from ballet and theatre and opera. We'll work with anyone. And it's important because in terms of creativity, going back to cross-pollinating and also how we can be inspired by other people in seemingly unrelated industries, the best work comes when you're challenged by other people or you think of a problem or a creative concept from a different discipline's perspective. We grow because if we're only going on our own lonely track, then we're only copying ourselves and what we've done before. My friend Gary calls it filling up your well. So I do, I work with all sorts of people and I work is, if you get a chance to look at our website, no two of my shows look alike. This is a fantastic thing. So we've just done our timeline, and you can see how it's speeding up between the last 200 years, 1820s to now, like the zoetrope. 
If I come to my original profession, which is in the theatre, and something I love, this is one of my most favourite, favourite, favourite theatre production designers, German designer, and this is a production, I'll just show you 10 seconds of it moving, of a moving set. And it's five mirrors on a stage. And at the back of the stage in the wings, there are two projection screens. The production is Dangerous Liaisons. And it's a very minimalist set. So what's happened here, and in the making of magic and joining up the dolls, is we learn our craft. So our little friend Alfonso, right at the beginning of The Magician, he opened up the box, he understood the principles. Peter Jackson can make three enormous films. Albert Einstein can talk about space-time continuum. We do these things because we understand our craft and we allow opinions and information from other people's disciplines to help us move forward and gain new insight. And we're doing it more because we, we're able to access all this information. And in theatre, it's, it's a good tracking parallel. We performed in villages. Then we upgraded and we went around towns on the back of a truck, you know, a little horse-drawn hay wagon. And then we became more and more sophisticated. So our craft technology, our ability to replicate, um, if we said a gentleman from Verona, we bloody built Verona on stage. We got really good at the plaster work and the detailing and everything. And we got all the way up to the top and we had rigging and special effects and smoke and mirrors magic to do dream sequences and all of that and then something interesting happened we started designing like this and the reason we started designing like this was because going back to boiling it down to its essential parts we're storytellers whether we're marketeers or architects or theater production designers or filmmakers we have to communicate with a very important audience because if we don't have an audience we don't exist there is no magic we were only able to do this process that we're seeing behind us. So what happened was, I don't need to build a palace in Versailles and produce a show perfectly replicated down to the detail. I know my craft well enough and I understand the story behind it well enough to take away all the non-essentials and boil it down to something really simple. Five revolving mirrors. The scenography comes and goes. It gives you hints, but the main principles are that the story of Dangerous Liaisons is all this back room machinations and secret you know, conversations going on and manipulations of a very superficial set of people. This set replicates that. The cast run through. You can see the reflection of somebody going off stage as somebody's coming on stage. The audience understands the underlying message of this twisting, turning, rabbit warren of, you know, conspiracy. Very, very clever. But we can only do that because our audience has also developed that sophistication. We don't need to give them all the information anymore. And it's important as a creative that we, we can overgild everything. We can put in too much detail. We can confuse it. And actually, you'll we'll find from creative writers, marketeers, theatre productions, it's usually more powerful the less we actually give them. So if you can write something in 200 words, it's better than 2,000. If you can do three daubs of paint, it's more powerful than if you've re replicated the whole thing. In theatre, we're telling the spirit of the story and communicating the experience. Architects can be inspired by, let's say, a cathedral. And I can walk into a building that one of them has done and come into an atrium space three stories high. I've not been to the cathedral he's been to, and maybe it's a forest, but I understand the experience of being in this beautiful, you know, high space with the sky or sunlight or shafts of light. Um, I understand what he's trying to get me to experience. I'm going to say something before I go to the next slide, it's quite important. Okay, so I work with corporate clients and brands. I work with visual and performing arts. I do touring museum exhibitions, and we do snow. 
And to relate all the things I've said before, and back to this last slide, the way I came into doing it was I got a brief from a client, a very exclusive private Swiss bank. And they were launching in Hong Kong, and I spent two weeks going, chocolate cheese clocks, chocolate cheese clocks, what the hell am I going to do? It's not going to be a trade exhibition. And I had to sit down and I had to join up the dots. I did word association, and I went through a mental process of, what are they really? Not the nuts and bolts, not the opening hours, what are they? meaningfully, you know, what's the experience that they're trying to sell to their audience, and more importantly, what does their audience need to understand to make them want to join? So I sat there and I did word association, and I went, private bank, exclusive elite, probably old, a little bit safe, um, uh, exclusive uh, uh, elite, um, rare, difficult to get into, rare, rare if I dare, mountain top, I'm going to build a bloody snow top mountain. <laughs> And in that snow top mountain, I'm going to put beautifully bespoke made Chesterfield sofas and wing back chairs. So I'm going to join the two things together privilege, wealth, luxury, comfort, mountain, rarefied air, elitist. And they're all going to be amazed. It's fantastic. And in the process of producing this, I went to my friends who were the world leaders in winter effects and went, Can you come to Hong Kong and make my snow for me? And they went, Yeah, we can do that. And then they investigated me and they went, well, she works across all our disciplines. Would I like to be doing the winter effects in Asia? And I went, yeah. Because this goes back to why I said at the beginning, why I can do all these different things. I understand my craft. I have the technical skills. I adapt them in different ways. Little Alonso understood the principles of magic. Now he's pulling plastic flowers out, disappearing Boeing 747s. If you have the basic skills, you can then create and imagine and fill in the gaps to get from here to here and create something new and original. For me, we took on the soy because it's all the same skills. We set dress, we design, we're logistics, we need to go somewhere and do something. We need lorries and crew and all the rest of it. So we took on the snow. This is a shot from one of our teams. We're, there's teams of us all around the world. You might recognize the picture from day after tomorrow. It's the library set, it's made with wax. And we have all sorts of clever machinery. And the thing about the snow, the way it was created, was Darcy, who started snow business in the UK, was a special effects guy, and his friend had a plastic packaging factory, and he was standing there talking to one day, watching the little bits of plastic chopped off the end of the packages fall on the floor, and he went, that looks a little bit like snow. 30 years later, 250 products, um, a network of us all around the world, and we are the world leaders in winter effects. The picture you're looking at now is Nike Snow Day commercial last year. And it looks like it's out outdoors, but in actual fact, it's been shot in a studio. So everything on the ground and all the buildings is produced by the set builders and all the snows from us. And the background is CG, so that's green screen. The perfect marriage of two technologies, you know, to come together to create the total illusion. Now, the thing I learned about working with the snow, one of the very first things I did was a massive mini film TV commercial for Chinese New Year, a bit like a Super Bowl ad. And the same principles apply. We need to use very little to translate to our audience what it is they're looking at. So we do a lot of big scenes. We've done lots of big movies, Day After Tomorrow, Lord of the Rings, Narnia, Vertical Limit. I mean, we do a lot of big movies, and so we have to be very clever about how we use our product and how we dress sets, because we don't want to be wasteful. Now, the camera perceives depth of the snow only in the foreground, and the audience have to buy into this huge snowy environment. What we do is we do our snow very thick at the front. Our snow, by the way, we've got lots of different products, but it basically, it's paper, or plastic, or wax, are the principal three products. So on this sort of a set, we're using paper, and we have big machines, and we dress the set. We make sure that if it's supposed to be a thick snowfall, that we have thick snow where the audience can see it. So you see the footprints, you see the tire treads. 
to be credible for the audience to buy into it, you have to see the snow in the treads um, on window ledges. Beyond a certain distance, we just go to a thin layer, we just write it out, and then CG, if we've got a mountain in the back, takes over that back portion. The audience is now seeing their actor walking through thick snow, they're seeing it in the treads, and they believe they're looking at a full snow scene. So we're able to use as few components and understand how to work, what we do and what we've learned, to create an illusion for our audience. And that's the trick. Anybody can do anything if we spend as much time as we want and if we add in every piece of information. Really good creative, and this is true of ad campaigns, books, literature, anything, are able to do it with less rather than more. We have the craftsmanship, we can get all the details right, we have a whole array of skills at our fingertips, but what we choose, like the Alonso, is the things that we know that are going to hold the trip together, the frames of the zoetrope that are going to come together in the audience's eye, and it's this partnership between us and them that craves magic still today. Magic is now called illusions. Everyone's an illusionist. Lots of magicians went out and got new business cards because magic's now, I'm an illusionist. <laughs> and we're all illusionists. By the mere dint of it. And because we're creators, we're always slightly advanced of our audience. They're intelligent and articulate and also knowledgeable enough to get the gag, to get the trick, to come with us on the ride. But going back to any technology is sufficiently advanced, we're still in that area. We are always, if we're good at what we do, slightly ahead. That's magic. <laughs> Done. <laughs> that was the five minutes of the presentation. Thank you, Jessica. Oh, wait, can you leave that? Oh, I'm doing it. Do we have, actually let me grab, um, can I, George, could you help me with the microphone? Do we have a first question for Josephine? Be kind. Of course. <laughs> from memory, what is the hardest thing you've had to have a client or an audience, you talk about buying into something, is there something that stands out and how did you join the dots to overcome that? I've had quite a few of them actually, and I quite enjoy them because the bigger the challenge, um, I think a lot of creatives in this room have had what we know as an open brief, which we all dread because it means they don't know what they want. <laughs> um, I can't think of a specific, well I can think of a million specific ones, but I'll go in general. The thing is when we get a brief from a client, now are we an architect, are we a marketeer, are we an advertising executive, are we a show producer? When we get a brief, and here's where we go back to the gaps, we're told, I want a wow effect, or I'm selling this product, or I want to, you know, and we have to look through and we have to understand actually what they're not saying. So we go behind to, why are they doing this event? Who do they think they are? What do they want to say about themselves? Who are their audience? You know, we go through a thought process always um, because an awful lot of information isn't put down in a brief and we work through it. I think that the example of the snowy mountain top was a pretty tricky one. Um, we, we've had so many challenges over the years. I can't think of a specific one. Blank, the sponge is empty. <laughs> but I will think of one and tell you after. <laughs> Another question? Yes. George is on the same. I can keep this snow down because I can do some measurements like the material. Ah, oh, okay, good question. Okay, so the, pre the previous principle, the previous principle way of doing snow before was two things. It was either broken up polystyrene, which wasn't very realistic and it was fluffy and it flew away, and it didn't look like snow and it fell on you and it didn't look like snow because it stayed on you. Um, and the other thing was using salt, which of course is not very environmentally friendly. So we have huge machines, we call it a Kremlin, 
the papers know that all the wax both have different machines. So um, the paper is milled. We've got different different grades of it, and we it comes out at high speed with a fine misting of water that makes it slightly damp, and that gives it some weight. And it also turns it from just looking like you know fluffy cottony paper into looking more like more like snow. But when we spray it on vertical surfaces, it sticks. And depending on how we dress it, we can make it look very light. And it's great because if you're doing a forest and the snow is nearly always directional, we will create that scene where you've got all the snow on the sides of the tree. So it stays up, and then we clean it by using high pro high pressure water um, hose to get it off again at the end. But once we put it up, it will last for weeks or even months, unless we have like a typhoon or a tropical downpour. Um, the wax, so this was on a studio, outdoor locations. We also do, particularly more in America and the UK, shopping malls, so dressing big, large outdoor areas to turn it into a winter wonderland. Um, <laughs> I love winter wonderlands. <laughs> Um, we can dress trees and rooftops and um, the tops of branches and everything. Um, I didn't include a picture actually that I wish I had now. Um, one of our favourite projects with the snow is Game of Thrones. Because as you know, winter is coming. So we you know we've got five books worth of work still coming in that direction. Um, and one of the shots is from the scene from the forest. And again, you know, this is where we had an advance from we put salt polystyrene down. Our snow that we have on the actors, and we use it in live events, is a dry foam. It's, a, it's almost like a washing up liquid, but it goes through a machine at high speed, and it comes out, and it has a very light, and we can change the size of snowflakes. So we can have those tiny little beginning snow particles all the way up to big, snuff, uh, fluffy snowflakes. On camera or in, you know, in theatre, it does what snow should do, which is as soon as it hits a warm body, it melts, it dissolves. So again, we have these steps where we create something that becomes more credible, that helps tell the whole story in a realistic way. Did I answer? <laughs> or did I go off piste? I do that a lot. We have time for one more question. Yes. No. Yes, there is one. Very interesting stuff, actually. Uh, I have one. There's more. I'm actually going to come and talk to an empty hall for five more mornings because I've got to fill it all in. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, I have to ask for the paper. Do you recycle afterwards? Ah, okay. I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> um, actually, that's really. That's a really good question because, again, this is where real-time applications and where we need to respond to our audience. Now, if you see some of our show reels, we worked in New Zealand and Canada, we work out on locations. Um, our products, are, our paper products, are actually made from recycled paper. And, but it breaks down into two ranges. So we have a chemical-free range that has absolutely no additives in it. It's pure, mulched-up paper. We have to have a fire retirement version for working in studios because we're working with hot film lights and there is a real fire risk. But when we work outside, we work on environmentally, uh, with our environmentally friendly products that are totally chemical free. Now the thing is, we clear it up, it's obviously biodegradable. If we work in a forest, um, any little bits that are left on the ground, it's paper, it comes from wood, it's almost like mulch, it goes into the ground. So. We're constantly, in fact, almost every year, we change one of our products over because we've discovered a way to make it more environmentally friendly. We do Glastonbury every year, um, and we did a snow setting, and we use our snow blanket, and we put it down, we use all our lovely environmental products on top of it, and one of the organisers at Glastonbury went, my snow blanket, is that environmentally friendly? And we went, no. But no, we have one. You know, we're constantly evolving. We're constantly learning how to do it better. Our plastics have no chemicals in them and no oils, so they're not toxic, they don't burn. We have to be responsible in lots of different ways because we also have to protect people's lives, which is why we have the fire retardant. Um, and it's also why, going back to the story of how we actually do our settings with the snow, we actually try to be not wasteful. 
you know, so less is more. We do what we need to do to solve the, the credibility of the visual, and then after that, we use this, what we've got is a permafrost. We actually use it for making a frost setting rather than a, a thick snow dressing, and it's tiny, tiny little um, grains, and we use that to dress out the larger areas because that literally just washes down into the ground so we have much less waste. <laughs> yes, we're very environmentally friendly. Thank you so much. Please give Joseph a giveaway prizes for the audience. Um, we have three. Registration didn't go so smoothly this morning. I think there was a lot of people that didn't sign in. Um, please do sign in on your way out so we know that you attended. Um, and given there was three people that asked questions, if you wouldn't mind, please come up and uh, you will be the receivers of these gifts from SCAD. <laughs> contain a gorgeous sketchbook. Hold on. There we go. And hold on. Oh, is that trip? A canvas pencil pencil case. Forget where that one is. And you're gonna have to put these back, Simon. <laughs> and a wallet, a leather Ooh. wallet. So congratulations. There you go. Thanks for asking great questions. <laughs> Next month, October 21st, please put it in your diary, um, our event is going to be held at Lead 8's office in a, a um, very young but very successful architectural multidiscipline practice based on Shipyard Lane in Quarry Bay. The theme is a little bit tricky, uh, but it was transparency. So that will be next month. Um, and then the following month, I'm already going to give some lead up to November's event. I'm not going to tell you what the theme is yet. But that is going to be our second birthday celebration, so please put that in your diary for the 18th of November, because we do want to have a big party first thing in the morning, okay? So, um, last time, last year there was champagne, 8 a.m. on Game On, okay. So, um, also, Josephine, do you want to just tell us a little bit? We have one more little surprise for everybody. Please register on the way out, and then you will receive a phenomenal little gift pack. It's a tube of our magic snow. Just magic add snow. water and you get snow. Yes. To so bring home away with you, please do not open it and throw it all over Scad's beautiful canvas. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone have a great Friday. Oh, and please remind them, um, Pinky will show everyone around for a tour that if you have time, it's well worth being even later to work for. Please do it. Okay. Thanks, everybody.